Another death occur, it will be newspaper headline. This will tell you to the, the extent to which they have gone. And Professor Ladikpo told me that nobody, no woman who is pregnant and comes into a national health service institution in the United Kingdom can ever die within that hospital. She must leave that hospital alive. This will tell you the extent to which they have done in building up their health systems. We are going to talk about Nigerian health systems. So I begin to appreciate what I'm really talking about. So that is direct medical causes. Indirect medical causes are causes that are either pre-existing before pregnancy and had become aggravated by the pregnancy or problems that are coexisting with the pregnancy. We are talking of uh, things like cardiac failure, tuberculosis, HIV, even gender-based violence. So women have been beaten to death because they are giving, repeated, giving birth to repeated females. Yes, so women have been strangled to death by their husband for giving birth to the fifth female baby. So it's a cause of maternal mortality, gender-based violence. Now, let us look at the non-medical causes. These are the causes that myself as a doctor and the ordinary citizens like you may not totally be able to control it and pieces of it that we can play a role towards. What are the non-medical causes? We have four groups. The first is underlying socioeconomic and uh, sociocultural factors. The second is what we call reproductive health factors. The third group is health systems and health services factors. This is where you're going to see where the government has failed. Then the fourth group is where there is lack of access to um, emergency of status care, delay in access to emergency of status care. Now, if we take this and social, um, socioeconomic factors, these are related to the low status of women with respect to economy, to income, to legal, to social and um, legal autonomy. Now, if we take education, Education is key to the development of any nation, especially if you educate the woman. If you educate the woman, you educate the world. If you empower the woman, you empower the world. Now, look at our National Demographic Health Survey. Whereas, that is that of 2018, whereas up to 98% of women that were educated sought antenatal care and delivery, in orthodox facility with good health care providers, only 46% of the uneducated women did same. This will tell you the place of education in the question of maternal mortality. Economy, poverty is one of the things that prevent women from going to seek health services in orthodox health facilities. We are going to see how it comes. Remember, Nigeria. In fact, it is believed that 45% of Nigerians live in absolute poverty, below one, one United States dollars per day. It is also believed that, and you know, 133 million Nigerians are living in what they call multidimensional poverty. I mean, the politicians used it to campaign for us. But whether they are translating whatever they use into something meaningful to us is another question. 133 million Nigerians are living in multidimensional poverty. And we have told last week or last two weeks by the same World Bank, I'll tell you the story of World Bank, that another 4 million will join the poverty club in the next six months if nothing is done about fuel subsidy that have been removed. Those of you who listen to the news, this is true. Four million is going to be added within the next six months. Who are the people? Oh, it is me and you. Oh. Me, I'm also part of the poverty street. Because if you cannot afford to pick food, there are things you used to do that you cannot do. I used to go to Newe every day. But now I cannot go to Newe every day. Because of fuel. Each time I go to Newe and come back, 9,000 naira fuel will go. So I am also part of the multi-dimensional poverty. They are talking about improve, increasing electricity tariff. 
I don't know whether they have, but they are going to increase it. That will even add another dimension of the poverty that will be added to us. You know, Nigeria's road to this poverty didn't start today. In 1988, during the time of Babangida, falling commodity prices, large scale indebtedness, brought about by corruption and uh, bad governance, made the World Bank and IMF to come in to attempt to restore fiscal discipline through the introduction of what they call structural adjustment program, SAP, the belt tightening measure. SAP was in the short term aimed at debt recovery and in the long term was aimed at sustainable development. Now SAP prescribed certain things that destroyed us. Number one is devaluation of the Naira. I hope you know that the Naira is devalu devaluing now. Good. Number two is retrenchment of workers. Number three, embargo on employment. Number four, removal of subventions to educational institutions. Number five, removal of subventions to health in institutions. The result was terrible. It meant that the factories started closing. All those factories that were producing um, textiles and all, they all started closing. Because the Naira at the time, which was three Naira to one dollar, suddenly became three Naira to 22, three, the, uh, one dollar to 22 Naira in that 1988. Tell me what is one dollar now? 752 Naira. 780, okay, 780 something. So we are marching, we keep marching towards that doom. And that is why we are not making the necessary demographic dividend that is being expected for Nigeria. Instead, we are trajecting into demographic doom. You retrench the workers. There was embargo on employment. And you know, the politicians welcomed it. They were not employing. They said there's embargo on employment. I will tell you what I witnessed when I came in as commissioner, when I had only two, two doctors in the whole of the local government system and only two nurses of the cadre of staff nurse midwife. All the others were metrons, 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 who could not give injection because they were old. Every work, every work, whether it's health or anywhere, requires injection of young people, young people that can make it work. And so what, what was the effect of the retrenchment of workers on embargo and employment? People, we began to see vices. We began to see armed robbery. We began to see kidnapping. We began, we began to see commercial sex work about the girls. And then there was massive exodus of the doctors and lecturers to the Middle East. Is it not what is happening now? A lot of our lecturers, I know my, a lot of my friends, even in this our university, are left. A lot of the doctors, the young doctors are talking to them. They are filling forms that they will use to go to Canada. Or you, or you are telling them, come for lecture. They will not come. Even, even the people who are medical students are already making plans on how to japa. So are we really, can't we ask ourselves questions? We cannot continue like that. So that was the effect of the structural adjustment program. It rendered us poor. And the same thing that was happening at that time is happening now. That is for economy. One has an impact on maternal debt. If you go to the North, the product system does not allow doctors, especially male doctors, to cater for the women. Instead, they'll go for traditional better attendance. And then even in the South, the activities of the prayer houses, if you go to a place like Cross River, you'll be surprised that the PhD is going for antenatal and delivery prayer house. It is as bad as that. Go to acquire, go to, it may not be like that in an and they die and they say that is 
the way God wants it. If God wants to be alive, he will not die, God wants it. You know, Peter B was told that he should come that that is the way God wants it. And Peter B said, not to, to be behaving like to be rigging a life. So it's not always the way God wants it. God has given us a free will to survive and not to allow ourselves to die needlessly. And so that is the underlying social, social economic and social cultural causes. Culture, what we call patriarchy. Patriarchy is a situation where the male holds sway. The male dominates. Whatever he says is final. And there are some places where a woman did not even go to antenatal or go to deliver without the permission of the husband. That is why sometimes I wonder, a woman needs cesarean section. People are waiting, has the husband signed? The husband does not need to sign. That woman is of age. And she can take care of herself. She can sign on her behalf. You don't need the permission of the husband to sign to go and save her life. But that is the culture. That is where the man holds. Then we have productive health causes. When a woman is having pregnancy and delivery at teen, as a teenager, pregnancy and delivery too early, pregnancy and delivery too soon, that is poor spacing, pregnancy and delivery too many, pregnancy and delivery at an old age, all of them have risks of maternal death. Then we take the one I consider to be the most important health systems and health services factor. It is one that is not under control of mine. It's under the control of the policy makers. Now, Nigeria has three health system structure. We have primary health system that is responsible for the health centers, primary health centers. We have secondary health system that is under the, the, the government or the state government. Then you have tertiary health system that is under the federal government. This is the broad arrangement. Now, Nigerian health systems, I want to tell you, regrettably, is one of the worst in the world. WHO, at its last assessment of the Nigerian health system, is ranking Nigeria number 187th out of 191 countries. I don't know whether it is sinking. 187th out of 191 countries is what your very dear, good, dear Nigeria is ranking in the health system. That is to say, most of these small, small people, small, small nations are better than we are in the health systems. Now, Nigerian health systems has become like that, and it's not the salutary one. Now, health systems are controlled by the policies that the country makes. It is the policy that determine or that govern the health system. But policies are driven by three forces. The first is money, funding. The second is men, human resources. The third is material, equipment, and the drugs. So if we talk about money, money is important if you want to do anything right. See, you see, Nigeria has money. If our money is being channeled with all honesty and with all accountability, look, we'll be living as well as somebody who is coming from Saudi Arabia or coming from Dubai. True or false? Now we are talking about money. Let me tell you, it might interest you to know that healthcare cost per head of Nigeria is only 67 United States dollars. While the healthcare cost for an American is 7,000 United States dollars. That of somebody from Switzerland is 6,000 United States dollars, healthcare cost per capita. Why is it so? Most of the money for health care in Nigeria comes from your pocket. Household. Household accounts for 75% of health care costs in Nigeria. Household. You can imagine somebody who is already poor. 
that is accounting for 75%. Can you call that? How will it look? 75%. Only 13.7% comes from government. 13.7% comes from government. And the remaining 11.3% comes from international agencies, donor agencies. Even that 13.7%, if it is properly imputed into the system, will be very, very well taken care of in terms of our health. But that is not to be. If we look at the health budget for Nigeria over the past 30 years, it had vacillated between 2.87% to 5.86%, which is very low. Because the Abuja Declaration of 2001 recommended budgetary allocation of 15% of the overall national budget to health, 15%. But here, for health in Nigeria, it has been between 2.86% and 5.86%. Yet the declaration was made in our own Abuja. And many other countries are using it. But we don't bloody care because we are wallowing in impunity and disrespect for laws. Good governance is eluding us on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the Nigerian government occasionally comes out with policy. One of the most important Act that came on board recently in 2014 is the National Health Act aimed, aimed at bringing an, in enough money to provide for the people's health under what is called basic healthcare funding that we provide what we call universal health coverage. What do we mean by universal health coverage? It's a situation where people, you and me, can go and access healthcare without dipping our hands into our pocket. That is universal health care, health coverage. Now, the 2014 National Health Act, which was one of the last things that President Jonathan signed into law, stipulates that 1% of what you call consolidated revenue fund, that is 1% of the total budget of Nigeria, should be allocated to the basic health care funding. That was in 2014. Buhari came into power in 2015. They kept planning. 2016, they were still pl planning. 2017, they were still planning. Then 2018, they landed. What did they allocate as basic healthcare funding? Only 60% of that consolidated, 1% consolidated revenue fund. 60% in 2018. In 2019, they brought it down to 57%, 57-something percent. In 2019, no, sorry, in 2020, it was 43.3%. In 2021, they brought it down to 25.8%. Oh, in 2022, they brought it a little bit up to 31.8%. And in 2023, they plunged it down to 21.5%. Tell me how you can sustain healthcare with this kind of rascality. I call it a rascality of budget. So we cannot, we cannot achieve universal health coverage with this kind of funding of the health system. That is why our health system, you see, every year we bring out, every five years we bring out another rolling plan, strategic plan, strategic health development plan. What we do is they go and recopy what they had five years ago, change a few words and roll it up. Nobody has assessed what happened with the other one. Nobody has tried to improve on it. And that is what we see every year. There's a lot of frustration. So that is for healthcare funding. Now, what about men? By men, we mean people who are looking after us as doctors and nurses. Now, it is believed that the more, the number of skilled birth attendants in a country, the better their maternal mortality situation. Skilled birth attendants 
in the country is total of only 43%. With rates that vary from 98% in Imo State to 3% in KB. What I mean is that only 3% of people go to offer to seek services with skilled better attendance in KB. You can see why our statistics still keep getting poor. The people over there in the North, they don't want to hear. And over here in the South, when we want to hear, they want to pull us down, pull us back. They say quota system. So that is what it is looking like. And studies have shown that rarely does any state meet the basic requirement for what we call emergency obstetrics and newborn care. There are basic requirements. So that is in terms of um, human resources. Now, what are the characteristics of the health worker in Nigeria? Number one, they are poorly motivated, poorly remunerated, not given the opportunity to undergo training or to uh, undergo um, um, refresher causes. And therefore, they keep getting frustrated. A lot of them are nagging at the patients. The other characteristic is the output is low. The output is low because they're not motivated. It is low because they don't have the competencies. Or, you know, at times, well, you don't know what to do. You don't snag and uh, you know, scare everybody away. They didn't have the competencies. So don't think that they are nagging for nothing. Many of them had not been paid salaries. Many of them had not been promoted. Many of them had not attended any conference. That is why if the chief medical director of this hospital, Dr. Joe Baja is here, I would doff my heart for him. I want to tell you, this young man, who is also one of my students, if you see the amount of infrastructure that is putting up at the permanent site, maybe 10 buildings at the same time, but that is not where I'm going to. Where I'm going to is the human resources development. Do you know that over the past one month, he was able to attract, just like our vice chancellor usually attracts so many things, I'm going to ask him, there's something I want him to attract to Igwe, to attract to Neni. <laughs> this last month, June, from 7th of June to, to, to 30th of June, we undertook training of health workers in emergency obstetrics in Anu and Dezeka. A total of 450 health workers were trained from Nayu. And many of them, oh, the decay is horrendous. There are some basic things, equipment to hold like this. They have never seen it in their life. And yet they are supposed to be saving women's lives. And many of them confess that this is the first time that they have been exposed to this kind of training. So it is that bad. I am of the opinion that chief medical director should build in. Look, you may have all the good equipments in the world. You may have the best building in the world. But if you don't have people that have capacity to work, to do those work, you won't make any headway. So medical directors, chief medical directors, must build in human resources development into their budget, the budget of their system. Build the capacity of your people so that when they are working, they are working with confidence. You know, nowadays, oh, it's very dangerous to be a doctor because a patient comes to you and is complaining. All those complaints that he's complaining to you, he had read it up. Oh, Google had told him what to expect. So he has information, maybe more than you, the doctor, if you're not careful. So as you are talking, say, hey, doctor, I don't think. Oh. He says, oh, shut up. You don't, what do you know? You? Say, doctor, uh, you're not right. Oh. And that is why these medical people should be adequately trained to be able to do their work and deliver what they should deliver. So let us move there. We don't talk about materials. You know, it was our bachelor that said, 
our hospitals have turned into mere consulting clinics. Mere consulting clinics. The hospitals are bad. The equipments are not there. Are you trying to give me time? You know that this is not inaugural lecture. <laughs> inaugural lecture is different from this because inaugural lecture, what you do as a professor over 28 years is not what you can, but I'm going to, I'm going to render it, make it shorter. But you understand what I'm talking about? Okay, let's move on. Now, the long and short of all this is that the death of a mother is bad enough for the immediate family and for the nation. And the death of, the death of women consequent upon pregnancy is an infringement on their life, on their rights. Women's sexual and right, reproductive rights, right to life is infringed upon, right to liberty and security is infringed upon, right to health care and protection, right to benefit of scientific progress, all, most of the rights are infringed upon. Now, what have we been able to do with respect to this uh, maternal mortality? I've been able to our interventional efforts had hinged on three main areas, working with non-governmental organizations, working as commissioner of health, then working as the, the president of the Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics of Nigeria. We were able to undergo train, undertake trainings, advocacy, training, and research on various aspects of maternal health, working with a lot of organizations, IPAS, Society for Family Health, uh, CEDA, Canadian International Development Agency, United Nations Population Fund, International Planned Parenthood Federation of America, so many organizations. In fact, uh, Professor Majulu read out some of them. We were able to do a lot of work um, under this uh, group. But importantly, as Commissioner of Health, in fact, uh, Professor Majulu also mentioned some of the things that we're able to do as Commissioner of Health. As Commissioner of Health, I set up the Anambra Health Systems and Healthcare Financing Scheme. The Healthcare Financing Scheme model, the Anambra model, is in the books. If you go to the people who are reading masters and PhD in health policy and health systems, you see the Anambra Healthcare Financing Model. It is the handwork of my humble self as the Commissioner of Health in Anambra State. And of course, my very dear wife here used part of the work that we're doing for her thesis, part two final thesis. So she has a lot of publications related to what we did under that system. We were able to establish a school of med basic midwifery, midwifery in Anambra State. We were also able to implement the statute that created the um, Anambra State College of Health Technology, which trained health technicians. Then in the area of human resources development, we're able to do a lot. Let me tell you, I told you that by the time I came on board, we had only two nurses in the whole of the 21 local government areas in Anambra State. I got the governor to get approval and we got one one at least for each of the 21 local governments. So that made it now a total of 23 doctors for local governments. The important turned to that, the governor was able to approve the recruitment of 58 doctors, 350 nurses, 16 optometrists, 10 laboratory scientists, and 200 medical support workers. It had never been done in that state, I tell you. Please, we can give him a round of applause. We were able to, when I came on board as the commissioner in Anambra State, if you went to the Chajina Hospital, where the chief medical director, uh, Dr. Bele, is here. I think she was even private to what I was saying. If you came to the Chajina Hospital, the, the, the corridors, immediately it's two o'clock, everybody had gone. You see goats and sheep lying in the corridors of the ward. There was no work, there was no life, there was no action until Governor Gigi came and changed all these things. Very, very, very tough man, if you know him. And he's a no-nonsense man. I walked with him, but I saw him. 
I was, I was on my feet throughout, but it paid off because our people became better for it. We were able to develop even private, public, 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 and public community healthcare partnerships. It was then that we were able to get assistants, volunteers, doctors, specialists from neighboring teaching hospitals to come and partner with us and assist us in developing the health systems of the state. It was then that somebody like Professor J.K. Mejulu came over and set up the neurosurgical unit for us at Tonicha General Hospital. And these people of the state were better off for it. So that was part of the things that we did at that time. Let me leave this particular area now. And briefly, it will not take time, briefly talk about the other areas. Unsafe abortion. What is unsafe abortion? Termination of pregnancy carried out either by persons lacking the necessary skills or in an environment that lacked the minimum medical standards or both. Unsafe abortion, about 121 million unintended pregnancies occur annually. And as high as 35 million are induced to abort. Out of 25 million are done under unsafe circumstances resulting in 39,000 deaths annually. Most of these deaths, 97% of these deaths occur in developing countries, Nigeria inclusive. Unsafe abortion infringes on women's right to life, right to health care and protection, right to benefit or scientific progress, right to decide on whether or not to get married and found a family, right to decide on whether and when to have children. So, Part of what was responsible was there is what we call the restrictive abortion laws in Nigeria. We will not have time to talk about abortion laws in Nigeria, but if you understand, there are so. Can't women be allowed to make their decisions as individuals with conscience? Why must we use legal restrictions? We also, we usually say abortion is the right of a woman. One is not advocating for it, but all the same, I think it is not proper risk to, to jail people, jail a woman, because she took decision that she wanted to take on her own. That is a matter for some other time. But I, Whatever interventions that I had had to do was basically training a lot of people on uh, women-centered post-abortion care. Post-abortion care is, by the way, an approach to reducing maternal deaths from abortion and its complications and saving women's health and pro protecting their, their sexual rights. So we're able to train, in fact, in our institution, we institutionalize the training of house officers on women's centered post-abortion care. Remember, when we talk about abortion, it means miscarriage. It's not just that somebody went and performed abortion. When a woman is miscarrying, we also call it abortion in medical circle. That is what we call spontaneous abortion. We can also have induced abortion. So that is, these are some of the things that we had had to do under working with a lot of non-governmental organizations, training, building the capacity of health workers to be able to prevent the problem related to unsafe abortion. They will talk about traditional harmful practices, gender imbued practices, usually infringing on the sexual and reproductive rights of women related to gender-based violence and gender inequality. Now we're talking of female infanticide, female genital mutilation. We're also talking of son's preferences, widow's rights and widow rights, in, widow rights and widow's rights infringement. These are some of the traditional harmful practices that infringe on the sexual and reproductive rights of uh, women, which needn't be. Now, what were we able to do? I was able to, in 2008, undertake training. Uh, okay, we were able to develop the two bills that uh, was, were earlier shown, the bills on sexual and reproductive health and rights at Anambra State Government and also the bill prohibiting maltreatment of widows and widowers in Anambra State. 
those bills were able to um, encourage the House of Assembly to pass into law. That is bill that is related to traditional harmful practice. Then the fourth of the thematic areas, we're almost coming to the end. The fourth of the thematic areas is gender inequality. What does gender inequality mean? Uneven, uneven, unequal visibility, participation, and empowerment of sexes in all spheres of private and public life. Inequality between men and women occurs in many aspects of life. Take health, education, nutrition, politics, employment, name it. There is gender inequality skewed towards favoring the men because they are men and towards disfavoring the women because they are women. Gender inequality constitutes an infringement on the sexual and reproductive rights of women. Right to life, right to uh, equality and freedom from discrimination, right to information and education, right to freedom of thought, and rights to several rights are being infringed upon. There are three main approaches to gender inequality. In gender equality. Number one is equal treatment. What is good for the goose is good for the gander. The second is mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming. Instead of trying to fit in a square peg into a round hole, why don't you readjust or restructure that round hole so that a square peg can fit into it? That, that is gender mainstreaming. The third one is affirmative action, which the House of Assembly threw out during the last Senate. That is a situation where you allocate 35% of positions to women by virtue of the fact that they are women and they have certain deprivations by virtue of being women. This country is not gender sensitive. This country, as far as I'm concerned, suppresses women. Go to Rwanda. I just came back from Rwanda last month. Go to Malawi. Go to Kenya. You find that affirmative action is holding sway. Go to Finland. 80% of the cabinet are women. And here, people are begging to include one or two women as the members of the executive of the house. And the men say, no, you cannot develop alone. You must move on with the women. If you move alone, you cannot go far. But if you move together with other people, you go far. So we, the country must listen to what we are saying. Let us not continue to individualize and be selfish to the point that our country is bleeding. The women must be given a chance. Yes, so that is gender inequality. I was able to undertake a training for the Federal Ministry of Health on gender mainstreaming in the health sector. And for the Federal Ministry of Health and all its parastatals, all the federal, med federal medical centers, that was in 2008. And at that time, we had recommended that each institution should have what we call a gender desk office for the purpose of mainstreaming gender amongst the workers. Now, the last of the abuses is gender-based violence. What is gender-based violence? Any act that results in, or is likely to result in, physical, sexual, and psychological injury to a woman, irrespective of where it happens, whether it is in the public or in the private space. We are talking of physical, sexual, and psychological harm that occurs in the home which we call domestic violence, spattering. A lot of time, women are beaten to death by their husband. Spouse are raped. The husband rapes the wife. You have no right to rape your wife. Spouse are raped. These are domestic violence. Then you have physical, sexual, and psychological injury occurring in public places. We are talking of women trafficking for sex work, labor, or pornography. We are talking of gang rape. We have a lot of gang rape. Then physical and sex, sexual and psychological harm condoned or perpetrated by the state. 
So the state also causes gender-based violence. You know how? Let me give you two laws that are promoting gender-based violence. We had the penal code. Penal code was operating in, in the Northern Nigeria. Penal code section 55 of the penal code allows a man to flood the wife. So when you marry a wife, you buy a cane for her. And flood her, provided, the law said, provided the man is doing it for the purpose of correcting her. That is section 55 of the penal code of Northern Nigeria. Now section 150, section 155 of the penal code of Northern Nigeria states that it has to do with sexual intercourse with a minor, a girl who is not up to 16 years. That law states that anybody who is convicted of um, having sexual intercourse with a minor, it should be regarded as a misdemeanor. Misdemeanor is minor offense. And when found guilty, he should have 12 strokes of the pay of the cane. 12 strokes of the cane. Provided, though, there's a caveat to it. You know the caveat? Provided that at the time the man was committing the offense, so he did not know that that girl was below 16 years. And also, provided there are two witnesses to that act. Can you see how stupid the law is? Somebody is trying to have sex and then go and find witnesses too. <laughs> so that is why when we say condoned or perpetrated by the state, that is where the state comes in as a causative agent for gender-based violence. Now, what are we able to do about gender-based violence? We know it infringes on women's rights to a lot of things. Now, we were able to be part of the legislative advocacy team to the seventh assembly to pass the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2014. And it was passed into an act of parliament. And I was a co-chair of the ministerial team that reviewed the guidelines on the operationalization of the medical aspects of the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. That was in 2015, 2016. So that was part of the efforts. I'm not going to list every effort. I'll just take one example because time is not on our side. But I believe in me, I'm going to finish soon. You know, there is always a, a, a way we talk when we're teaching like this. If time is choking you, you can say, uh, okay, I'll, I'll finally. Then people will sit up. It gives you a leeway to talk more. When you've talked a little bit more, they say, <laughs> at last. Then they will sit up again. It gives you a leeway to talk and talk and talk, or at least finish what you want to say. You say, okay, finally, finally. Very soon, I'm going to get to finally, finally. So there are some things I call the reflections of certain aspects of what we did under women's health, which is bordered on leadership and innovation. I'm not going to take it wholly, but leadership is very fundamental. Everybody sitting here is a leader, leader of one sort or the other. You can be leader in your family, you can be leader in your department, you can be leader in your society, but you always aspire to be leader. But leadership has characteristics. A leader must be patient, must be exemplary, he must be able to listen to the people who is leading. He should yearn for excellence. The leader should have courage. The leader should be able to assist the people that is leading. He should be able to reward people who have done well and should be able to punish people who have done badly in order to act as a deterrent to others. But most importantly, the last, but this is most important, a leader should be strategic. What do I mean by strategic? Strategic leadership is predicated on vision. Anywhere you want to come as a leader, our, our vice chancellor came and he said vision 200. It meant a lot. It means that he was strategic in his thinking. This is where I want to get to by the time I finish. That is vision. So when you have made the vision that you want to do, then you share that vision with people, people you are working with. Shared vision enables ordinary people to perform extraordinary tasks. That is what shared vision does. Nigeria is not sharing their vision with our people. And so nobody understands what they're doing. And nobody therefore cooperates with them. And they are just playing their game anyhow. And we are what's up for it. 
So shared vision enables ordinary people to perform extraordinary tasks. Now, having shared your vision with people, how do you go about it? First of all, what is the current reality with respect to what you are talking about? When you have identified the current reality, you now say, what are the root cause analysis? What are the things that make reality what it is? Having gathered this, you go to the drawing board, what we call strategic planning. From strategic planning, you now move to implementation with accountability. Accountability is very, very important. Whatever you are doing, you must bring out your scorecards. People will see what you are doing. I don't want to talk about when I was trying to build the society house for the society house in Abuja as the president of Sogon. But believe me, I built that house in five months because I was giving my scorecards and my people were bringing money. And we did the Sogon house. And everybody wanted to be part of that because we carried them along. They were ordinary people, but they performed extraordinary tasks. Building a house in Abuja from beginning to finish and furnishing in five months. It's a big feat. It had to do with strategic leadership. And so that is what we had to do under leadership. So most of the things I have talked about, the state government, leadership in society of gynecology and obstetrics of Nigeria and all, they are all predicated on this trajectory, on this method. So I'm not going to bring them out one by one anymore because I've done that before. Now, what about innovations? One of the things that leadership should be able to have is you know, innovations. See, the vice chancellor and his senate is starting a Jubilee academic lecture. Over the years, nobody has thought about it. It is new, but it's going to be magical. If you saw how it was read at ABS in the radio, as radio commentary yesterday, you will appreciate that this is a very serious business. Yes, it is true. Many of our academics are not here, but it doesn't matter. We shall talk about our people later, but maybe not in this forum. Because you cannot give what you don't have. And you have to be present and witness how things are done in order to do it and do it properly. You cannot stay in your, stay in your house and become a, an erudite scholar. It's not possible. When this kind of exercise is going on, and somebody who is a, a, a senior lecturer, lecturer one, or whatever, is sitting in the house, can you ever be an erudite scholar? No, 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 you cannot. So we must be able to, and I'm happy the students are here, because these are people who are going to be lecturers tomorrow. So you see what, what we are talking about. There has to be a change in style. We all passed through that. I'm sure my VC, my provost, by, by the Professor Emeritus, everybody passed to this tutelage, call it tutelage, apprenticeship, in order to become erudite as a scholar. It's not by word of mouth. It's not uh, by, by uh, quota system or whatever, which is what governs Nigeria. So they were, my turn, it's not my turn. You see, the turn has come now. Let us see what is being made. Of. It's my turn, all right, it's your turn. We are seeing, we're waiting. We are waiting. Well, that is not a subject matter for people. Now, innovations. Professor Emejulu had brought out some of the innovative things that we, are, we were able to do. And uh, we have been able to do some of them, like the um, simple method for retardant loose cervical circulation teach, all the input we have made into bringing out things that are new. One of the most important things I want to tell you is there's a book I wrote. I wrote this book. I don't believe it. It took me six years to write this book. A very simple book titled The Total Woman and Her Man. That book is written for everybody who can understand simple school search English. But it covers everything anybody, boy, girl, man, woman, old, young, should ever know about the reproductive health of human beings. The total woman and her man. I wrote it mindful of the fact that it should be useful to every household in Nigeria. It's a pity I've not been able to market it properly. But 
one of the people that reviewed this book, Professor Hansen, my friend from, from um, um, Sheffield, he said, this is a fantastic book. But Brian, I tell you, Nigerians don't like reading, but break it into small volumes. So we had volume one, volume two, and volume three for easy readability. You can lie down on your bed and read it through within one day, you finished one. But the kind of information you go home with is extraordinary. And that is one of the things I believe is a legacy I'm trying to leave as footprint in the sand of time. By the time I leave, this is this book. It's in Amazon. And then, look, if you don't have it, please try to own it. It will help you, it will help your friends, it will help. The first volume is The Woman, Facts and Fantasy. The second volume is Pregnancy and Childbirth. The third volume is Diseases and Disorders of Women. So it covers everything about women's health. And that is why I'm taking pains to bring it up here. Of course, the Jubilee Academic Lecture is an innovation. We all recognize that. If we say, yes, it's an innovation. I took time to go to the internet to check whether it is done anywhere in the world. And it dawned on me that this is the first in Nigeria, the first in Africa, and the first in the world. And so the way that ABS rend rendered it in the radio, he said that Unizik is once more blazing the trail in academics. It's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, in conclusion, you see, sexual and reproductive health is very critical to the development of any nation. We have said it before. Countries, notably of the third world, have this notoriety for infringing on women's sexual and productive rights. And we say that in Nigeria, unsafe motherhood, unsafe abortion, traditional harmful practices, gender inequality, gender-based violence are all areas of abuse, the sexual and reproductive uh, um, health and rights of women, which efforts had been put in to try to make right. In spite of the, all these efforts, we still continue to wonder, are we really stepping the stairs or are we stirring the steps? Because it looks like the route, the road, the wrongs to the zenith of that ladder is very far away. Otherwise, our statistics should be improving. It has become necessary for us to strategize. Go back to the drawing board, re-strategize, and know what to do to promote, to uphold, and to protect the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women. Now, we made the following recommendations. That sexual and reproductive health should be mainstreamed into the health systems and health policy framework of the nation. Let me ask us is it too much for our legislators in Abuja and in the states to provide for free antenatal, free delivery, free family planning for we, for us in Nigeria? Is it too much of, to ask? What are they legislating on? This is the one that concerns the common man. No woman should die because she's trying to have a baby for us. They want to legislate on uh, uh, petroleum. Uh, which one concerns us on petroleum? Which one concerns the poor woman who is looking for food to eat and petroleum? I'm not saying they're not good, though, but that one that will affect people. So that that woman that is pregnant will go to a place where she will at least try to survive and not go to a place where she will die. 
Okay? And we also think that there should be what we call a continuity desk office in every index government. Because what I found out when I was in government, there is a lot of disconnect and discontinuity between a pre-existing government and the next one. I tell you what I put in place under the healthcare insurance, the Anambra State Healthcare Financing Model, which I know Delta came and copied that time, um, Lagos copied that time. By the time the next government came, they threw it out. So there should be a continuity desk office so that there will be policies, projects, and programs that were started by index government, by former government, can be finished and continue. Good ones, not bad ones. Of course, Buhari tried to do that. He con continued with Niger Bridge, isn't it? Uh, continued with um, Lagos, Ibadan Expressway, and a few things. It is good, he continued. Let us continue with other little, little things. So we also think that the health budget should be implemented according to the way it is recommended. Why would you want to give 2.86% to health when you were there and signed the document for providing 15% to health? Why should you, the recommendation of 1% of consolidated revenue funding for um, basic healthcare funding, you want to cut it down to 60%. You want to cut it down to 43%. You even bring it down to 25% and then to 21%. It is because nobody is asking questions. No. You can't do that abroad. Though. Why would these things not be done the way they are recommended? Then we think that there should be legislation against traditional harmful practices, and all the other things that need to be legislated upon, including this free antenatal and free delivery I'm talking about. We also think that output from donor agencies can be improved upon to the extent that uh, it will be put in one basket to be disbursed and then properly shared out according to needs. Yeah, Mr. Um, MC, just give me fin the final shot. I'm going to take the final shot in the next three minutes, it's over. Then we talk about human resources development, training and retraining of health workers, improve their remuneration, make them belong, carry them along. You begin to restructure the health systems to the extent that they are relevant and put in effective referral structures. You begin to also, even some of the provisions of international conventions that Nigeria was signatory to, begin to domesticate them. Begin to talk to the men and the boys to and uphold the sexual and reproductive rights of the women and the girls. I can say, finally, finally, John F. Kennedy, one of the greatest American presidents, once said, and I quote, in giving rights to people which belong to them, we give rights to ourselves and our country. Having said that, there was this professor of astrology, a Chinese professor of astrology, who gave his inaugural lecture titled The Dynamics of Space. So, using, of course, the register of astrology, which many people in the audience did not quite understand. But the professor kicked, punched, danced, jumped up and down, trying to make people understand what he was saying. So that people were clapping for him, not from the point of view of the stuff he was bringing out, but the way he gesticulated, danced. So his theatrical performance 
was what was telling the audience, not the stuff he was bringing out. Unfortunately for this professor, by the time he finished his lecture, everybody had left the hall. It was long, his lecture was too long. The lecture was too long. That by the time he finished, I'm sure Professor Mbani knows what I'm talking about. By the time he finished, everybody had left the hall. Only three people were remaining. One person had fallen asleep and was sleeping. The second person had a pile of books in front of him. And the third person was at the door. So when the man landed from his travel to the astral world and looked around, said, ah, ah, where have they all gone to? He looked around and said, well, this lecture is not for ordinary people anyway. And then out of curiosity, I said, I'm a man of research. Let me find out. Young man, young man, why are you there? The man sleeping. What the man sleeping did was he simply got up and left. Because he had seen that all people had left. Then, and you, with books, the man with books, why are you, why, I'm out of curiosity, I want to know why you're still here. He said, well, I was waiting for you to finish so I can give my own lecture. Then he looked at the door. Oh, the only man, uh, uh, Oga, what about you? Why are you there at the door? The man said, I was even waiting for you to finish so I can lock up the hall. So it looks like I have given a long lecture, but I don't think I can be equated to the Chinese professor who, who, gave, who, who talked for too long uh, because I did not see a lot of people leave the hall. A lot of people are still in the hall. I did not see anybody lying down. I did not see anybody with a pile of books. I can, I can say that I have made a little bit of sense in what I'm talking. Mr. Vice Chancellor, Igwe, DVC, distinguished academics, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my very dear wife, distinguished students, thank you very much for this opportunity to be made the sinosure of all eyes, courtesy of this very first Jubilee academic lecture of Namdi Azikiwe University. Thank you. I <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, another round of applause for him. Mr. Chairman, sir, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, believe you me, this lecture and this pattern, very, very unprecedented, to be frank with you as a professor of political science. This is the first time I am seeing this kind of presentation for someone to present from the beginning to the end without looking at anything. Not only that, 
Not only that, he was able to put everything correctly, including the figures, the punctuations, the grammar, the everything. No wonder the beautiful wife Dolly doesn't give him any chance at all. On a bomba to bomba. So we salute you. We salute you. We congratulate you. You said that uh, women are like salt in the soup, and that without the salt, the soup will be. There's less. And somebody quickly put in, what of those men that don't take salt at all? And they were happier when you began to talk about something and, uh, and others. So very nice lecture, very nice lessons, and very nice present. In short, very, very wonderful. Please, another round of applause for him. When I grow up, I would like to be like you. I am just eight years a professor, and I'm already shivering. I don't know. 28 years is something else, and we salute you. The, dif the, the, the difference is very, very, very clear. Mr. Chairman, I will have formally invite you for the decoration, but permit me, grant me the grace to recognize others so that that particular program will be the, 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 the peak of it all. So we have in our midst distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of the Adimas family here present. We have in our midst Barista Ima Adima, Professor Adima's twin brother. The twin brother is here. Where are you? Oh, Nani are you? No, Nanka, the Caucasian are going to go. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> we salute you, sir. We also recognize Dr. Mrs. Norma Obiajulo, a resident doctor in the Department of uh, Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology. Thank you. Namde Azikiwe University Teaching Hospital, Newi. She is Professor Adima's daughter. For cause, not the reason. Thank you. Dr. Fred John Obiajulo, consultant patho pathologist, Professor Adima's son in law. We recognize Associate Professor Ogachuku Ezejofo. We welcome you. He is representing the CMD. And he's here present. Please, may we salute you. We welcome you. We welcome Mrs. Ugochuku Uche. We welcome you. Dr. Anyoku, Dr. Odili Okoye, the MLS Jackson Njoko, the Chief of Staff to CMD Nayut. He's also here. We recognize Mrs. Obioma Onyudo, wife of Emeritus Professor Iken Onyudo, is here. We welcome you. We welcome Professor Mrs. Obioma Ogele of the Law Faculty, Dr. Onyi Ogele, Consultant, Department of O and G, Nayut, Dr. Chiazo Anya Chabelo, MD at Medical Center. We welcome you. Professor Rob Egwa, to former DVC, is also here. We salute you. Dr. Tochiko Ogwewe, Deputy Director, Center for Sustainable Development. John Obodo, Research Associate in CSD. Professor D. Okoli, we welcome you. Professor Ifedi Orama Ijimeri Nwana. If I'm Obia is also here. Former Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dream Professor Wakos Visishi is here with us. Professor Joe Akabike, former Honorable Commissioner of Health, Anambra State, 
and current chief medical director, Juku Emeka Odimego Juku University Teaching Hospital, Amako Oka, we salute you. Professor Emeka is on immediate past rec, Imo states, we salute you. Ainsilege, no. Professor Festus Okoye, Professor Dr. Amaka Akudo, Dr. Ben Obuago, Reverend Sister Dr. Bibiana Iruka Obi. Lecturer, the chair, Professor Richard Owapwe. <laughs> May I invite you to perform this uh, crucial function? Professor Joseph Ifani Brian D. Adema, kindly come up so we can recognize you appropriately. Mr. Visisa, to the podium. <laughs> Professor Adema. It's a vice chancellor, sir. This is the first time that a Jubilee academic lecture has been given in this university. We seek your authority to approve the establishment of a formal register for those who deliver Jubilee academic lecture. If the VC so approves, may we invite you to acknowledge Professor Joseph Adema as the first Jubilee academic lecturer and authorize the entry of his name in this famous register. This is a good authority. Thank you very much, the chairman of the inaugural lecture committee. Um, by extension, the chairman of Jubilee Academic Lecture Committee. I hereby approve that the Jubilee Academic Lecture, whose inaugural and maiden uh, lecture we've had today, be officially adopted and registered as a program of our university, and the register be so open to duly recognize all such uh, Jubilee Academic Lecturers. Thank you very much. And it is therefore it's therefore my honor. It's a great privilege to officially decorate Professor J.I.B. Adema as the maiden, as the first Jubilee academic lecturer of Nam Diazikiwe University on behalf of Senate, on behalf of congregation of our great university, Nam Diazikiwe University. Congratulations, Professor. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. In further recognition of this uh, very important status that you've so attained, it's my honor also to present to you an accolade of honor presented to Professor Joseph Ifai Brian Davis Adima on the occasion of the delivery of the first Jubilee Academic Lecture of Unamde Azikiwe University today. Thursday, the 6th of July, 2023. And this particular plaque is a symbol that you have so been accorded this status. And on that note also, there is a trophy of honor still presented to you as the first Jubilee inaugural lecturer of our great university. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen. We'll take the next program very quickly, and that is endowment by the mentees of the Jubilee Academic Lecturer. I call on the mentees to please come forward. Uh. Uh, please, may I call on Dr. Afia Digwe to please lead your group to the stage. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and the Vice Chancellor of the Happening University, permit me to call on all mentees of uh, the Jubilee lecturer that are here present to come and join us on this podium. Our Jubilarian, why not prof? Even uh, mommy. Yeah. yeah. Students of this great university, or associates, or residents, I stand here as the president of the National Unisic Medics Alumni Association. I'm also the coordinator of the Diaspora Unisic Medical Association. 
and um, I want to say that we are happy today to be associated with the first Jubilee lecturer of this great university, ably led by this great man, Professor Esimone FS. We are proud of you, sir. What can I say unto the Lord? What can I say? Is thank you, Lord. What can I say unto the Lord? All I can say is thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Brought you, Lord. All I say is thank you, Lord. We have nothing to say, but we are happy to say that we learned from the master. We were well tutored. And because of that, we are proud to be associated with our teacher. We are proud to be called students of Professor Joseph Ifine Brian D. Adema. And uh, today, we have seen the masquerade, not just a masquerade, but you are a Nigerian masquerade. If you agree with me, put your hands together for this Nigeria. Today is not really a speech making day, but there is no way we will not express how we feel. When he told us that he was going to give this lecture, university said they don't have uh, money. We say, Prof, you have people, and because you have us, you have money. That is what has happened. We, let me proudly say that. Students of Faculty of Medicine, we call ourselves Unisic Medics. We are all over the nation and all over the globe. And let me not miss word. I say that 90% of all our graduates outside or even within are doing very well. In fact, more than 80% of our products anywhere are in the best. That's the truth. And so we learned from Prof, so many things. Some of us didn't go into uh, ops and guiding. Someone like me, I take care of uh, the ear, nose, and truth. And of course, some of the pregnant women, when they come, I'd make them not suffer. Prof, you know. And so are all others in other fields of medicine. And we are all very proud to be associated with him. And we say that apart from what we have helped to do, to put up this together, part of way of appreciating our teacher and saying thank you, and saying thank you to this university that is made us who we are today. And what of pulling back to the university, we said we are going to inaugurate an endowment to the tune of 5 million naira in honor of our teacher. And so the Jubilee lecture round, the Maiden Jubilee lecture round, we have to liaise with the vice chancellor and university, and they will decide where they want us to put this amount. So that is why we are here. And we want to say once more thank you to the university for giving our own the first lot. We have to say thank you, Prof, for accepting to do this. And finally, we have to thank God who has made it possible that our professor is 28 years a professor and he looks as young as all of us here. Yeah. It, it can only be God. And so we thank God and we say congratulations. We are very happy to be associated with you. We thank the friends of the alumni. The other main thing is because some of us 
met prof at various levels. Mm -hmm. So we call them the friends mm -hmm. of the main mentees because we are the people that really suck the breath of prof. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All we have to say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Baba. All we have to say is thank you, Lord. I never see, I never see you. Oh, wonder, 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 wonder. Oh. Thank you, thank you. I never see this kind of God before. Wonder, 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 wonder. wonder. I Thank you. Let's, let's be seated. Let's be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please, we want to hasten up so as to conclude. Every other program will continue after the official closure. Uh, may I remind our guests? that we have a place for you after here at Ozoka Center, Faculty of Social Sciences, okay, just across the other side of the auditorium. And then all of us will also be here for our entertainment immediately after this. Uh, the cake will be taken to the reception arena. So please. Mr. Chairman, sir, and the Vice Chancellor of Namde Azikiwe University, Oka, our distinguished scholars, guests, ladies and gentlemen. We wish to appreciate in a special way our medical students who are the ones covering the program in a special way. Please put your hands together for them. We say we will have to recognize them so that we know that they, know, they, they, they don't only attend to medical issues, that they're also professionals or photographic or <laughs> as part of what we do. So we thank you and we salute you. May I invite a member of the committee and to the glory of God, the immediate past Honorable Commissioner for Education, Anambra State, Nigeria, Professor Kate Omenua, to do the vote of thanks. The Prof. Mr. Vice Chancellor, each time I'm asked to do a vote of thanks. I tell myself it's an easy job just to say thank you to everybody. But today, honestly, I don't know how easy this is going to be looking at the plethora of people gathered here today at this first Jubilee lecture. Um, I'll try my best, but I'm not going to call names as such uh, because we're already short of time. Mr. Vice Chancellor, 
let me start by thanking God Almighty for the gift of Professor Adema. We want to thank God. We want to thank God for all the lecturers, all the professors, all the medical people here, our professors who have been mentoring a lot of people. Professor Mbon, I salute you, sir. I really salute you. I heard your name over and over again where the professor was speaking. And we want to thank you for that mentorship you have provided. I want also to salute the DVCs that are here. The Igwe of Uneni, I want to salute you, sir. Efunaka Kandi Beginade. And I, and I share an affinity with you because I was born in Neni. Yeah. My father was the first principal of Laura Zikiwe, Wagu. Yeah. So anybody from Neni is my brother or my sister. And I say that with every sense of responsibility. So none, Nabani. I want to, after thanking God, really, I want to thank the vice chancellor of our great university. Professor Charles Simone, FAS. Prof, I mean, I'm not used to, you know, pre singing, but I must tell you that you have written your name in gold in this university. You have done that for so many things. And uh, for this lecture, the Jubilee lecture, it's going to go down in history that you are the first. Vice Chancellor to have thought about this and to have introduced it. I'm a member of the inaugural lecture committee and I'm aware of the financial contribution you have been making to make this thing work, both in the inaugural lecture and now the Jubilee lecture. I'm aware you provided the logistics, the planning, everything. And we are grateful for making this university to begin to have global visibility is something we're ever grateful for. Yeah. So I want to thank you most sincerely and most responsibly for today's lecture. I want to thank you very much. And uh, like Professor Mejulu was speaking, it's going to go down in history that today too, I delivered the vote of thanks for the first. Why are you laughing? That's true. Yeah, the vote is going so. So I salute you, my chair. I salute you for giving me this privilege. I salute you and I salute the um, local organizing committee of this lecture. I salute you, all of you. We've done great as, and we as a team, we we'll continue to make this university proud. Let me again thank with every sense of responsibility. I want to thank all of us who are gathered here, especially our students. Professor Dima is providing a role model for you, the students and us, like uh, my Dean said, when I grow up, I would like to be like him. I want, I would like to be like, I want to thank you. So the students, we thank you. I hope we have learned something today. I hope we have learned something today. So it's important that we aspire to be like this great man that is seated here today. I want to thank my friend and his wife, his wife, Professor Dolly Adema. I want to really thank you. Um, all of you in the medical team are actually mentors to my children. They talk about all of you a lot. And I want to thank you for giving this professor the enabling mind and the support to come to the level. When the vice chancellor was speaking, he said that behind every successful man, there is a woman. And that woman is not just ordinary woman. It must be a woman that is also successful. So we want to also thank you very much. I want to thank the theater arts people, the theater arts, for that beautiful play they did. I mean, that is teaching education to the core. If you do not understand all the grammar, everything that is being said today, at least you understand the simple one they said, they showed here. So we want to thank the theater arts, and of course the music people, all of you who have done so well to support what we are doing today. Of course, I want to thank Professor Emejulu in a very special, is he still here? Has he gone? Emejulu in a very special way. The way he gave his citation, I mean, it was full of fun and it was full of, it was very clear to us what man this professor is. Professor Emejulu, you can come up and give me a hug because you are my children's mentor too. You are my children's mentor. They talk about you a lot. Yeah. So 
um, we want to thank you for that beautiful rendition. That beautiful rendition. We are not a uh, um, uh, deputy, uh, uh, what do you call it? University director for nothing. Thank you very much. That was very well received. And of course, I'll call my dean, who is the orator himself. You know, um, otherwise he may sack me from the faculty. So Dean, I want to thank you. You're not just Dean, you are a very vibrant Dean. What you did two days ago here is unprecedented. We also, um, the faculty is also among the first of so many firsts. So thank you very much. And uh, let me thank in a very, very special way. Prof, Prof, Prof Adema, please leave him alone. I want to talk to him. Prof Adema, don't be jealous when I say this. I fell in love with you today. I fell in love with you today. No, no, no. Wait, I haven't finished. Stop crying. I haven't finished. I fell in love with your academic composure. I fell in love with your the rendition. I fell in love with your brain. My God. How could you have done all these things, you know, said all these things without looking at the script? It's unbelievable. Most importantly, I fell in love with your love for women. Your love for women. I fell in love with you, you know, for your love for women. And today, all the women here are giving you senior advocate of women. Senior advocate of women. Because I'm a gender scholar and it's so difficult seeing a man stand up to talk about women, to give us all those things. And let me tell you, what the thing about a woman is the woman is full of contradictions. He said all those things, all the Jezebel, mother of uh, Mary, mother of God, all those things. But the beauty, and that's why it's a myth, the beauty is that a woman can sit comfortably in those two positions. It only needs you to bring out the best in the woman and she'll give you the best. So I want to thank you for that. When they were, they're going to add that in your title, Senior Advocate of Women. We're going to give you that title. So I want to thank you. I don't want to take too much of your time, um, but there's a song I just want to sing so that we can end this. We say, Professor Brian, we salute you. Professor Brian, you adoyen. Professor Brown, you are a gem. Well done, well done. We salute you. Professor Brown, you are good. Professor Brown, we salute you. Professor Brown, you are a gem. Well done, well done. We salute you. Thank you, thank you. Honorable Commissioner Kate Omenugawi, thank you. Thank you. And we also thank the mentees of Professor Adima. I saw lots and lots of them. We salute them. A situation where even the wife of the former vice chancellor is also a member. It means you have done so well. You've done so well. We say congratulations. Mr. Chairman, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, may I respectfully invite the chairman of today's occasion and the vice chancellor of our great university Professor Charles Sokechukwe Simone, fellow Academy of Science, to come forward for the chairman's opening, chairman's closing remarks. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, sir. Our I love you also. Thank you, sir. Um, 
You guys are not going to make a negative news of Puricha. Ibenne. I said, 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 I the maiden inaugural lecturer, Professor J.I.B. Adema, has presented his lectures, the first Jubilee academic lecture, and he presented it so eruditely. It took a lot of time, but unlike the professor of astrology, the Chinese professor of astrology, we are all in the hall and we are not sleeping. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank this wonderful audience for listening with rapt attention to the very eloquent rendition that our maiden Jubilee academic lecturer gave unto us. I was also very marvel. I was wondering whether I was the only one seeing that he was able to render without looking at any paper, any book, nothing, anywhere. I thought it was uh, fiction. But when, you know, the university director came and reiterated that again, I saw, so I saw correctly. I think it deserves a very thunderous round of applause. In a special way, I want to thank your mentees who supported this program. And not only did they support the program, but they have come up with an endowment. Now, what that endowment means is that the next person that will be presenting this Jubilee academic lecture will not need to spend a dime. Am I correct? It will tap from that endowment fund. Am I correct? Am I saying the mind of the mentees? So we have the choice to thank you very much. So because of that, uh, we're going to propose, and I'll ask the chairman of the inaugural electoral committee to propose to sign it. Because there's now support in every direction. So nothing stops us from naming our Jubilee academic lecture after Professor J.I.B. Adema. So I want you, the chairman of the inaugural lecture committee, to propose to the next Senate that this lecture henceforth, because of this, we have to state it very clearly that our Jubilee you know, uh, academic lecture series will henceforth be named Professor J.I.B. Adema Jubilee Academic Lecture Series. And I also hope that because of this, more people, more of your friends, Mandine, Nimandoza, will still put more money into that endowment so that for all our Jubilee Academic Lecture Series, we don't need the lecturer to trouble himself. Some of them may not be well endowed and uh, in, in terms of human capacity, you know, trainings like Professor J.I.B. Adima. And we won't want funding to be a limitation to our professors delivering this lecture. So I'm saying why I'm appreciating what your mentees have done and why we're proposing that we also call on most of your friends and well-wishers to also donate to that fund so that in perpetuity, we'll be having Jubilee Academic Lecture Series carried out free of charge to the lecturer and without cost to the university. On this note, I want to thank all of us again and I wish the lecturer and the wife and the family, the mentees, and all of us here at Namda Zikwe University, a pleasant trip as we travel back. It's my honor, therefore, on behalf of Senate, the Congregation of our Great University, to declare the first Jubilee academic lecture closed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Please. We take the closing prayer. I may recognize the Dean Faculty of Education, uh, Professor Vivian Wobo, 
we salute you and then Professor Siwayo Bodo, I can see you. Thank you very much. Please, may we be informed that the inaugural lecture, not the inaugural lecture, sorry, the Jubilee lecture is available. You know, we are so used to inaugural lectures. So <laughs> the Jubilee lecture is available. It's going around, printed and published. So please make sure you take one home. We take photographs outside the auditorium immediately after the recession. May I also appreciate Professor Cecilia Eme. I can see her over there. Sorry, we are announcing it now. Mr. Chairman, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, may I invite uh, Professor Cecilia Eme, please come and lead us in the closing prayer, please. Immediately after the prayer, we take the recession to be led by the Vice Chancellor. Thank you. May we rise for the prayer. In the name of the Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that history is made today in our university. We thank you for your great enablement. We thank you for bringing all of us safely here and then keeping all of us safe till the end of this program. We thank you for the university, the vice chancellor, the administrators of this university. We thank you for all our guests here present. We thank you for the lecturer, the Jubilee lecturer of today. We pray you Lord to always be with us in all we do in this university. Help our vice chancellor and all his efforts to bring this university to limelight. Be with all the lecturers, the teaching and non-teaching staff of this university as we work together for the progress of this university in your service and service to humanity. As we live here, Lord, please lead us safely to our various destinations through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father. Eunice Dixon. <laughs>
National Anthem. Thank you. We'll take the recession to be led by the vice chancellor. Then the lecturer, the DVC, the lecturer, then the DVC chairman, and all those that are robes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So please, our, all our guests are asked to move to Ozoka Center. To Ozoka Center. Thank you. All professors of the university, you move to Ozoka Center as well. All our professors, we also move to Ozoka Center. All directors, all directors, you move to Ozoka Center. Thank you. Praise the Lord, 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 let the peace the Lord, praise the Lord, the Lord, praise the Lord, the Lord, have given the glory, praise the Lord, the the